Good morning. Welcome to the live streaming worship service of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. I'm Bonnie McFarland, a member of the worship committee, and I will be one of your worship associates today. You will also hear the voices of Grace Preuss and Adam Wedeking. We invite you to worship with us today with an open mind and an open heart. As we, As we enter into sacred time, time, created by our presence and shared intent, I invite you to get comfortable. Turn down your phones or other distracting devices. Make a conscious decision to set aside for this one hour the self-protective walls we keep around our hearts and our thoughts. Let us remember and explore together what has drawn us to this faith or learn what this faith is about and relax. Let the stresses of the outside world slip away as together we focus on this time together. And together we breathe. Although we are now a community connected largely by electronic means, one day we will be together again Yet even now we are those seekers with the yearnings to learn, to understand, to make the world a better place and with the same desire for fellowship. And so we are here seeking that living interconnected web of which we are a part. Let go of the anxieties, the fears, the expectations of your own or others making and join us in this hour of beloved community and so together we breathe. Our opening hymn this morning is Wade in the Water. Please rise in spirit and join us. And because we are Zooming, nobody will know if you sing off key. worship, I invite you to read with me the mission statement of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. Our mission is to foster a diverse religious community that celebrates life, affirms the individual, encourages spiritual growth and open thought, and works to advance social justice and environmental sustainability. Joan Artemis was a frequent guest speaker here a few years ago when she lived out here, but she currently lives in Massachusetts where she's a candidate for UU ministry and an intern at UU Wellesley Hills. Fortunately, through the magic of 21st te century technology, she's with us again today and she will be regularly for at least the next few months. Joan holds a BA in religion and society from Syracuse University. 
a Master of Divinity from Claremont School of Theology, and she completed a chaplain residency at the Yuma Regional Medical Center in Arizona. When not practicing her craft of ministry, Joan spends time with Kathy, her spouse and partner of 27 years, and Finley, their rambunctious cardigan Welsh corgi puppy. Joan, Kathy, and Finley live in Worcester, Massachusetts, the city that was the birthplace of both the birth control pill and the smiley face. Starting in the 16th century, masses of African people were abducted, subjugated, and transported across the Atlantic Ocean to the Americas under horrendous circumstances. Almost 2 million individuals perished during the excruciating voyage. For more than 200 years, the dependence on Black people in the United States generated prosperity, opportunity, and wealth for white Americans. As American oppression continued to develop an intricate and lasting mythos about the supposed inferiority of these Black people was designed to legitimize, pres preserve, and protect this unjust system. These lies endured enslavement's official elimination after the Civil War and are still very much alive today. But this system has made us weaker, not stronger. And our continued addiction to it is a sign of our dysfunction and national sickness. Before we can heal, we must first have the courage to admit that we have a problem. Hi, I'm Grace. Good morning. And there are a few announcements we would like to share. During the service, we will mention several website and email addresses and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all this information and it is available on our website. However, for those needing the information by auditory means, they will be announced verbally during the service. Chat time provides an opportunity to spend an hour talking among ourselves, usually beginning with the service, then wandering on to other topics. It's held on Zoom at 11.30. In order to participate, you need a separate Zoom link. So please go to our website at uuchurchofriverside.org for the Zoom chat time link. Good morning. Yeah, I've got a couple announcements about Social Justice Committee. We've got um, a meeting today after church at one o'clock. Um, those of you who got emails with information about the service should have a link to that as well. Um, come, go ahead and join us. If not, it's on the web page. Uh, we will be talking about a couple of things, including um, contacting our Board of Supervisors and asking them to support a, uh, the resolution supporting ACA3 um, that they'll be facing in March. We talked about this. This is to um, completely end slavery and involuntary servitude in California with no exceptions and no loopholes, um, closing the loophole that allows involuntary servitude for people who are incarcerated. So um, join us this afternoon, learn how you can get involved in that. And I will turn it back over to Grace. We are making progress. In Riverside County, the ICU availability is reported to be at 10%, finally up from 0%. Riverside County reports an average of 13.8 new cases per 100,000 per day, down from 44.9 as reported last Sunday. San Bernardino is also improving and currently reporting 21.5 per 100,000. In California, almost 5 million people, 12.3%, have received their first vaccine injection, and 4% have received the second. California has administered 74 of their current supply. According to the CDC, fewer than 0.001% of those who have received the first dose have experienced a severe adverse reaction, none of them deadly, unlike catching the virus itself. For information on getting the vaccine in Riverside, go to 
vaccine.riversideca.gov. And in San Bernardino, go to sbcovid19.com forward slash vaccine forward slash locations forward slash. For the most current and reliable information, go to the website for your county public health department or the state of California. You can also find information and links on our church website. The monthly UUCR newsletter comes out the first of every month by email and per request by postal mail. If you have something you would like covered or that you want to write, please let Dinah know at ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com or call or text her at 909-645-2885. If you haven't received the newsletter and would like to be added to our mailing list, please contact Dinah or the church office. On the first Sunday of each month, we share with you the joys and concerns that we have received throughout the month. When we're all in the sanctuary, it's easy for people to remember something to say because of what someone else shares, like a concern for their daughter's welfare or the joy they felt a few, year, a few days earlier when they got good news. But when we ask you to send these thoughts to Dinah so we can share with them, share them with everyone later by Zoom, I understand how it gets forgotten. But consider how you feel when you hear about another member who has fallen ill or who has a new job or a little one added to the family. Isn't that what helps us remember we are a community, even while at a distance? Your joys and concerns are important to all of us. The next sharing of joys and concerns will be on March 7th. Please email or text your joys and concerns as they occur to you throughout the month to, you guessed it, Dinah Rowe, our Caring Network Coordinator. Her email again is ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com. Or you can call and text her at 909-645-2885. We have two lightings of sacred flames. The first is Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Candle. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. Let us acknowledge that we walk upon the traditional territories of the Maranga, the original people of this land who continue, who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. In honor of the Maranga people, we, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as a steward of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to live out our dream of a world community of peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey in worship together. Now, Joan de Artemis will lead us in our chalice lighting. Today's chalice lighting will be, is entitled Justice, Meaning, and Purpose, and it was written by the Reverend Dr. David Breeden. We light this chalice, remembering and honoring our own tradition and celebrating the rich diversity and traditions among us. As we search for justice, meaning, and purpose, may we remember that justice, meaning, and purpose live first in deeply listening to one another.
Our next hymn is Spirit of Life. Please rise in spirit and join us. This portion of our service is about funding all that we do to care for our congregation and our beloved historic church. You may mail your donations and pledge to the church office. Checks only, please. The church address is shown here. Also, an easy way you can donate to the church is to scan the QR image on the right side of the slide with your phone. This QR code is also included in the monthly newsletter. A reminder that even though the church is not allowed to reopen at this time, the church expenses continue. Just a few of the expenses which are ongoing are the utilities and insurance and the administrator. Robert pays the bills and answers inquiries to the church, plus other things which come up on a daily basis. Sharing our treasure. Script and Stater, Stater Brothers. We have Stater Brother cards for your grocery shopping that also earns our church a percentage. Please contact Dinah Row or the church office to purchase Stater Brothers cards. There are also Best Buy and Ace Hardware gift cards in the office. Please see Robert to purchase these. Once more, Dinah's email is ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com and the church office email is admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. Amazon Smile. Another way to help is when making purchases through Amazon, Amazon go to smile.amazon.com and be sure to have the smile and choose Universalist Unitarian Church as your charity. We receive 0.5% of your qualifying purchases. And by using an Amazon script card, we receive a, we receive a percentage from both. 
Please donate as the spirit moves you by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity. And to those who give of their time and their talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. Our next hymn is from You I Receive. Please rise again in spirit and join us. From you. I will turn the service over to our speaker, Joan DeArtemis. Following the service, she has agreed to stay with us for 15 minutes of questions and discussion. Joan? My friends, there is a power at work in the universe. It works through human hands but it is not made by human hands. It is a creative, sustaining, and transforming power, and we can trust that power with our lives and with our ministries. It will sustain us whenever we take a stand on the side of love, whenever we take a stand for peace and justice, whenever we take a risk. Trust in that power. We are together held by that power. Now let us pause to share a moment of silence. It's February, and that means it is Black History Month. And I don't know who needs to hear this, but we literally would not have a United States of America if it were not for Black people. All through the 16 and 1700s, individuals were abducted from Africa, compelled into enslavement, in the American uh, enslavement in the American colonies and forced to work as slaves in a forced labor situation to do the work of, far of the farming of the tobacco plant and of cotton. And by the mid 19 or mid 1800s, the US's westbound growth and the abolition movement triggered a huge debate over this enslavement that would literally ripped the country apart in that blood-stained civil war. 
And even though the union's triumph liberated the country's 4 million, 4 million subjugated citizens, the vestige of oppression persisted. From the reconstruction period to the civil rights movement that materialized 100 years after the liberation. Slavery is our original sin. And if the last four years has taught us anything, it's that we are definitely not post-race. Rush Limbaugh died this week, and my sympathy goes out to all of his friends and family and all of those who loved him. As a Unitarian Universalist, I believe in the inherent worth and dignity of all people, even Rush Limbaugh. But according to Forbes magazine, as of 2020, Rush was still earning $85 million a year. That's $85 million a year producing writing and commentary, expressing his own viewpoints on race, LGBTQ issues, feminism, and sexual consent. Viewpoints that I personally find abhorrent. But strangely, to his exceptionally large fan base, he was just saying what we were all thinking. To many people, he was a hero. Well, the things that Rush said were not the things that I was thinking. Uh, but apparently, a lot of people, a lot of people in America were and still are. And that's kind of a problem. Most people have some sort of moral compass. Most of us have some sense of right and wrong. And not everyone agrees with everyone else about exactly what is right or wrong. But most of us have some sort of moral framework, some idea of these things. These things fall in the category of OK, while these other things fall into the category of not okay. And for most people, it's not a binary system. But rather, it's, it's more like gender. It's, there's a spectrum. There are things that when we see people doing them, they are good to the point of heroism, to the point of even being saintly. And other things that we see that are just plain evil. But much of what lies between is kind of under dispute, which is why if you've ever actually taken an ethics class, you know that the study of ethics is incredibly frustrating and often incomprehensible. This is because an ethics class forces you to take something that you just know down deep in your heart and define it in very academic and intellectual terms. So if I say killing is wrong, you would probably know, nod and say, right. But then I say, well, what about if it's in self-defense? And some of you may say, oh yeah, then it's okay. But then others might say, no, it's still wrong. And then if I say, well, what about killing to balance the scales of justice? You know, capital punishment. Again, some of you are going to say, okay, and some are going to be on the other side of that. Some of you think it's okay to kill animals for food as long as it's humane. Some others think that it's never okay to kill animals, even humanely. And most of us are constantly adjusting and readjusting our moral compass throughout our lifetimes. So that something that we had no qualms about at some point in our life, we are now appalled to even think that we may have done that. The thing is, there is something that happens to us when we find ourselves doing something that we either know is wrong or something that we did in the past that we now know is wrong. And, and that thing is called moral injury. Now, moral injury is no small thing. 
as a chaplain working in a regional hospital, I encountered it nearly daily. You see, along with our sense of right and wrong, humans also possess some sort of justice, a deep-seated need to balance the scales, to see justice done. <clears throat> Therefore, when we see someone or some group of people do something that offends our moral sensibility, our sense of right and wrong, we have a strong desire to see justice, to right the wrong or make the wrong right. Now, when you think about it, it's not terribly logical, okay? I mean, if I steal $100 from you, and then I give it back when I get caught, wouldn't that just reset the balance? I mean, wouldn't that set things right? I gave you back your money. But you would probably want more. You would probably want you to pay back extra for the pain and suffering, or maybe even go to jail to be punished. Because we, we have this entire legal system based upon this. And a lot of people called lawyers and judges that make a whole lot of money figuring this out for us. However, this is not just the realm of the legal possession profession. This is also in the domain of religion. Nearly every religion that I can think of, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, has some formal ritualized practice of confession. Why? Because, you know, that sense of justice I was talking about, that applies to us internally. And we, when we have done something that we feel is wrong, either voluntarily or because we felt that we had no other choice, we incur a moral injury. And then usually it is impossible to heal that moral injury unless we somehow balance the scales within ourselves. One of the ways we as humans do this is by confessing. Now, different religions have different traditions around this, but essentially healing of moral injury cannot begin until one has told someone else that they have done wrong. Many times this ends up being the chaplain in the hospital where a person realizes they are extremely sick and possibly or probably will not be leaving that hospital alive. People very often will want to tell somebody about that horrible thing they did when they were eight years old, that piece of candy they stole from the corner market, that, that terrible thing that they have to let go of before they can feel comfortable with the fact that they are dying. This is just the human condition. And chaplains hear all sorts of tales of moral injury, some minor and some profoundly disturbing. And this goes for people who, you know, religious people and non-religious people equally. It just seems like it's the thing that people need to do. But there is another thing that people sometimes do with their moral injury. And they can become incredibly, horribly self-destructive. When I was working as a, as a chaplain, I would sometimes sit with people who were in the hospital who were there essentially because they did it to themselves. Usually it was because their bodies were just collapsing after a lifetime of drug or alcohol abuse or some other self-destructive behavior. Sometimes they were handcuffed to the bed and there was a guard standing in the room with us because they were incarcerated and still needing hospitalization. I would end up hearing these stories about that, how they had done these terrible things. Sometimes when they were incredibly young, sometimes just a kid and they never forgave themselves for it. And they just needed to tell someone and that someone would be me just because I happened to be the chaplain on duty at the time. But often that terrible thing that was done to them was done to them by an adult. And, and yet they blame themselves for it their entire life. 
and they continued to punish themselves, thinking it was their fault. So moral injury is no small thing. It can have devastating effects on a person's life, as well as the lives of the people around them. It is for this reason that the fourth and fifth steps in the 12 step AA program are, quote, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, unquote, and quote, admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs, unquote. Many alcoholics and addicts start out with a deep sense of unrecognized moral injury and substance abuse is one strategy for dealing with it. This moral inventory and admitting to others is extremely healing because it is extremely healthy. It's also often a big part of, of therapy. But there is another thing that people can do with their moral injury, something that is not so healthy. They can try to rationalize it. They can try to show that, oh, it's not so bad because look at what those other people over there are doing. Or they deflect or gaslight, lie. And not only these are these behaviors considered abusive, but they are deeply unhealthy and damaging for the person who is practicing them. So remember what I said at the beginning about slavery being the, our country's original sin? Well, sometimes I sit and I think about those first men who abducted those first people for the purpose of selling them as slaves to the colonies. They must have known somewhere deep in their hearts that what they were doing was pure evil. And yet they did it anyway. How did they rationalize it? Did they tell themselves that these people were not human? That somehow they were inferior and that made it okay? And what about the people in the US who bought them, used them for labor, worked them to death or sold them? What did they have to tell themselves? What did they tell their children? What did their children's children tell their children? They had to develop a whole mythology around the people that they were subjugating and abusing to show that somehow it was okay because of whatever it was that they had to tell themselves. By the time the abolitionist movement got underway, that mythology was so deeply entrenched within the people in the South that they were ready to go to war and kill people to protect it and die to protect it. And that mythology persisted all throughout the, the Reconstruction era and Jim Crow and all through the resistance to the civil rights movement of the 1960s, right up until Rush Limbaugh said, and I am quoting him directly now, these are his words, quote, the NFL all too often looks like a game between the blood, bloods and the crypts without any weapons, unquote. See what he just did? You see that? With that one short sentence, he just reassured us all that all the discrim discrimination and bigotry and all the police mistreatment of people of color and all the underpayment and underemployment and underrepresentation that people of color continue to face in this country right now, that's all okay. Because somehow to him, black people are all just violent criminals, right? Of course, that's nonsense. But to his fans, to his fans, this was absolution. His fans can now feel better. His fans can say, Rush is right, Rush is brave. Rush is just saying what we all want to say. 
And his fans go on social media and say things like, I can't wait to get to heaven so I can hear his sweet voice again. He made $85 million a year handing out these little indulgences. This is very, very unhealthy. It's unhealthy because it's externalizing a process that really needs to be internal. It's like recognizing that your apartment is cold, but instead of checking your own thermostat or possibly calling maintenance for help, you set fire to the whole building. But I do think that we as a country are beginning to turn a corner. I could be wrong, but it looks to me like on January 6th, we kind of hit bottom, to use another AA term. For many of us, not all, but for many, the storming of the Capitol was one step over the line. It now feels like a lot of the country is finally waking up after one heck of a bender, rubbing their heads and saying, whoa, wow, what did I do last night? I better get to, a, uh, get to a meeting. One of the reasons I love Unitarian Universalism is not just that we love justice, but that we know we love justice. We have a whole second principle about it. Justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. And like I said before, we as humans have this inherent idea of right and wrong and this deep-seated need for this abstract idea of justice. But you use, kind of say the quiet part out loud. We come out and say that we believe in justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. We left all the God stuff out. Let people figure that out for themselves. We just got to the heart of the matter. Justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Keep that in mind as you watch what follows in the world, in the country, because there's going to be a lot of muddying of the waters. So like there's a, a freak snowstorm in Texas causing all kinds of pain and misery and suffering. And because we're a justice, we're justice seeking humans, we may be thinking, well, it's their own fault for not being better prepared instead of wanting to be Texas first in their energy policy, but also because we are justice seeking, compassionate people. We also realize that the poor, people of color, people who can least afford it are being affected the most because they may or may not have the resources and probably don't have the resources to deal with it. But there's still people going to be people around. There's still going to be people around who think that the people that are poor and people of color somehow deserve it. COVID-19 continues to shape our lives. And these vaccines now, there are vaccines now. And most states have a priority system for who gets the vaccines first. And not everyone is going to agree with those decisions. And there are people out there that somehow think that they are immune to the disease because I assume they are somehow superior to the people who get the disease. But the vaccine is out there and the numbers are already starting to come down. And that is a beautiful thing. But I heard Dr. Fauci just last night say that somehow white people are getting the vaccine first instead of the people of color who are dying the most. President Biden's first month in office has largely been about undoing what the first guy did, what the last guy did. And a lot of people are ecstatically happy about that. And a lot of other people are terribly upset. And this comes at a time when those people are probably also mourning the loss of their beloved Rush Limbaugh. Remember, we love justice, but we also love compassion. It is possible to be compassionate with people that we profoundly disagree with. 
So we'll continue to do our Black Lives Matter vigils and we'll continue to stand up in resistance to police brutality and we'll continue to stand up for immigrant rights and for the rights of indigenous people and we will continue to work for lgbtq equality why because it is the right thing to do and because we are humans with a moral compass and because we love justice and equity and compassion and because it's healthy we adjust our own thermostat and then we check on our neighbors to see if they need help with their cold apartment. Do we have, though, each of us as individuals, the courage to look at ourselves in these matters, to do that fearless moral inventory? Do we have the courage to face our own failings, our own weaknesses, our own vulnerabilities? Because these changes that are taking place, yes, they're going to happen on a large scale. And they are happening. I really believe it. I think we are on the verge of seeing something amazing. But we can't just wait for everyone else to get with the program. Change. Real change. Lasting change. Only happens when a whole lot of people take small personal steps to change within themselves. We're gonna do this and we're gonna make these changes, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's a healthy thing to do as well for ourselves and for everyone around us. Our closing hymn is number 101, Abide With Me. benediction, please close your eyes and reach out to each other in your thoughts. Feel the connection between us, the interconnected web, joining us as a community, a church family. Our benediction today is each of us ministers to a weary world by the Reverend Darcy Roke. There is too much hardship in this world not to find joy every day. There is too much injustice in this world not to right the balance every day. There is too much pain in this world not to heal every day. 
each of us ministers to a weary world. Let us go forth now and do that which calls us to make this world more loving, more compassionate, and more filled with the grace of divine presence every day. Amen, shalom, and blessed be. Now go forth and be mighty. Thank you, Joan D'Artemis, for sharing your valuable time and insight with all of us at UUCR. It is sincerely appreciated, and we hope you will visit us again. I hope everyone on this live Zoom service will stay with us following the next slide for 15 minutes of Q&A with our speaker. This will be included on the video that is posted. I do tend to actually drive. Don't I will I? be. I will be right back in thirty seconds. I have a tendency to backseat drive. I noticed. <laughs> what did she just say? You're the original driver. She says she'd be back in thirty seconds. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Hi, everybody. Good morning. So. <coughs> So it's Joan is going to be with us once a month, once a month for at least the next couple of months. Hi, there she is. She's back. Yeah, did you time me? <laughs> no, I I was going to, but you got back too fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally so that I can move my pulpit out of the way, pull, pull up the wing of my desk, and put the computer uh. on my desk. That's literally what it is. You can thank my lovely assistant, Kathy Nichols, for that. Ah, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> so we have 15 minutes as we have, uh, um, we have changed this format. I don't know if you know that, John, so that um, these, these after service uh, chats sometimes got going and would go on forever. And I got the feeling it was like, um, the, the ministers sometimes or speakers would get um, kind of cornered up at the pulpit and never get out to meet other people. So we yes. decided that this is 15 minutes and then the speaker, if they want to, can come and join us at chat time, but uh, this part will end. And so we have, well, actually, we'll give you 17 minutes. We'll go until a quarter after. Hmm. Do you have any questions for Joan or comments? I want to right off the bat say, uh, Margaret and Alec, that was a beautiful video you guys did. Yes. Yep. I enjoyed that very much. I think those were both new ones, weren't they? I think they were. Yep. We're very fortunate. Alec, you muted. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't speechless. <laughs> what happened? She said we can't talk. We can't talk. Okay. I don't I don't know why, but okay. I'm okay. Adam, with are, are they muted on their end or are we somehow doing Oh, that? we can't unmute? Because everybody is muted, as it appears. I can't unmute, Adam. Well, you and I are not muted, but everybody else is. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you. Let there be sound. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Can hear me now. now. Okay, yep. Joan, you and I have something in common. What do we have in common? Hello. Gotcha. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, Joan, you and I have something in common. We're both proud owners of Cardigan uh, Russell Cord 
Uh, yes. Yeah. Corgis are the best. It, it, I hope he didn't disrupt it too much. He was right underneath me playing with a toy, <laughs> making all kinds of noise. And I was like going, <laughs> Kathy. <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> My dog Katie is on the couch right behind me, but you can't see us. So uh, you can't appreciate that. But, uh, well, you could turn your video on, Tom. Anyway, I'm kind of a snob about uh, dog breeds, and uh, we uh, cardigan um, owners are uh, very discerning about. Yes, they're just they're just different. They have incredibly complicated, complex minds. Um, it's a joy watching him figure things out because he's incredibly intelligent. And um, it was the cutest thing. I gave him a, a little raw head, raw hide chewy. And he looked at it and sniffed it and looked at it and kind of changed the angle he looked at. And then he put out his tongue and tasted it and then very daintily took it away from me. But I mean, the thought process, you could just see his little mind working. What is that? I've never seen one of these before. Well, it's, it can be kind of challenging because we go for a walk every morning and uh, it's nice if your dog just walks along with you, but Katie wants to stop and investigate all kinds of things. So it's kind of a conflict of wills when we take a, take a walk. Yeah. Yeah. There's it, it, a con constant conflict of wills and he's um, I think he's getting ready to go into puberty. I mean, he'll be neutered eventually, but he's still too young and I think he's just starting it. He's getting really well willful. He has these spurts where it's like, I want my way and I am going to have it. Period. <laughs> it's like fighting with a 13 year old boy. I think I watch these uh, uh, shows on TV in the afternoon, legal shows where people have to speak disputes. And more often than not, um, people come up because they've had pit bulls that have attacked other dogs. And mm -hmm. So they're in big trouble because they have to pay vet uh, expenses and whatnot. I keep, what are these people thinking? Pit, why choose a pit bull as a pet? Because they've been bred to kill other dogs. And, uh, I've some pits that are just adorable and sweet, to, but, but most people- be a little take discerning it. about what breed you pick. Yeah. You know, we could have a good argument about that because I have a pit bull that would wiggle you to death with his tail. So um, they are trained by their owners for what they're going to do. But can we get back to the service? Willing to death <laughs> sounds pretty aggressive to me. Thank you for your compliment on the music. We haven't heard Abide With Me in a while, but that one's actually an older one. But yes, Wait in the Water is new this week. Yep. Yeah, that was nice. I like that. As I mentioned uh, to Drew earlier, if anyone uh, feels like they would uh, could, could contribute to the singing. Uh, I can send you the recording of the hymns that we play and you can send me a recording of yourself back and we can mix two in. Uh, and Alec has mentioned that um, as we get closer to potentially being able to open up, uh, we it, he would really like to have some additional people um, helping him with the, with the yeah. music part of it. Yeah, Alec, I'll probably, I'll, I'll, I'll join you along at some point when oh i don't know when studies quit keeping me chained to my desk all day when that happens then i suspect maybe there'll be increased participation so soon you said you are finishing school soon right you're almost done yeah i'll be done in like five months so I thought maybe people would want to see him. <laughs> I, li I like the I like the little finger there. <laughs> That's <is> pretty awesome. <laughs> Reminds me of Smokey. Is, she, is, she, is, she, is, she, is that a he or a she? He? He's a he's a boy. Oh, does he have the chroma? The chroma, right? Um, he has uh, he has blue eyes. Oh, okay. But one eye is, uh, the, the hair around is, is totally white. So he has eye, white eye, eyelashes. And the other eye, it looks like he's got eyeliner around it because he's got the color over that eye. It's very interesting. He's interesting. I managed to bring it back to dogs. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Um, it may relate to the service, but uh, earlier in the morning, I belonged to a, a book club, and the book we're reading is called Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent. And, yes. And, I haven't uh, read it yet, but um, i am got it on my list. Yeah, and um, so my perceptive is that um, we spent evolutionary eons in tribes, and uh, so we're very oriented to what our tribe is and what what others are, and it's um, we say, well, that's not appropriate anymore. We live in a, a wide world, and we just have to adjust to, um, and be somewhat at odds with our uh, temperament. We mentally say us versus them. And yeah. What's us and what's them? And uh, people like uh, Rush Limbaugh kind of play on that. Uh, um, instinct of human beings. Yeah, well, you know, you see it when you uh, and watch a sports event and one side's got one color uniforms and one color. I mean, it's, it's easy for us to do that. It, it, you know, my team has got this color uniform and the other team's got that color uniform and we can pick them out on the, on the playing field and so we know but it, it's really not appropriate in human relations. It really isn't. I was wondering, um, you know, Joan, when you talk, when you were talking about uh, the things, the justification, I guess you would say, that we have to tell our, that we as humans tell ourselves, or groups of humans tell ourselves, in order to do things which um, in other times we wouldn't do or in other eras or whatever. I was just wondering, um, I guess part of this goes back to putting yourself in another person's shoes mm -hmm. uh, and trying to understand when people would make those kinds of choices. So in, and I've done a lot of that, um, especially this past year, um, trying to, because as a universalist Unitarian, you know, the inherent worth and dignity. And so I'm trying to not demonize. Um, but uh, anyway, historically speaking, I was wondering, do you think perhaps one of the reasons why it became so easy for mm -hmm. the slave trade in the 16, 1700s, um, it, it, how do I want to put this? The slaves of black people in America wasn't like a brand new sort of a thing. I mean, it, um, within the African continent, within tribes, there were slaves back and forth within them, even with the Mayans, I mean, for, 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 you know, centuries or uh, millennia that if you fought, you got to capture, I mean, even in the, you know, the Jewish Bible, you got to capture your enemy and subjugate them. And so, um, so that's kind of already built into this civilization psyche. The Romans had slaves. Um, and then, um, you know, like uh, kidnapped, you know, Robert Louis Stevenson, there was that whole thing of, you could take people um, who weren't an enemy, perhaps, but take people and and for profit, you could sell them and they would be a slave to somebody else. And I wondered if kind of all of that together set up this, <clears throat> the system. Um, it wasn't just these people getting this idea and deciding to do this for their own selfish benefit, that, that there was a, a culture, I guess you would say, that already had existed for you know, beyond generations that set that up. That is absolutely correct. Um, it, it goes back to ancient times. Well, Do you have some? Yeah, excuse, but I, I'm curious, what, what is your question, Tink, exactly? You said, why, is, why, is the Amer why was the American slave trade so successful? No, no, no. I was just saying that we, we now, I do, I can't speak for anyone else. I look and feel this great amount of of shame and disgust 
historically what we have done in this country. And like Joan said, we literally have built every aspect, every successful piece just about of this country was built on the backs of, of slaves, uh, slavery as a system. And I was, and so in my head, it's sort of, um, it's easy for me to say, well, Americans are, America, Americans, this, this new experiment that we had in the 1700s or 1600s and 1700s mm -hmm. is, is uh, like a terrible thing because it was so, ba because it, of the faulty foundation of it. And, and in doing that, I was almost separating us as sort of a special thing in historical time to create what we created. And in going back to try and understand why did we create that, I think it wasn't that we sort of thought up this terrible thing to do to people for our benefit. I think it was part of a, I don't want to say evolutionary, but in a sense, a, that kind of a, a starting from thousands and thousands of years ago. And uh, this is our formation of it. Not that we created it, but it's our uh, how we utilize we it. We didn't create it. We didn't create it. Um, that's, that's, that's a really good question. And the answer to that is, is very um, complicated. But the thing that we did in this country is we broke away from specifically England and their um, system of monarchy. And uh, in doing so, we set up these very lofty values of, um, you know, all quote unquote men created equal, but at the time they were only thinking only white men that own property. But, you know, it's, a, it's we're working our way. But see, values change over time. So yes, you're correct. The Romans had slaves. The people before the Romans had slaves, it was typical for one group of people to conquer another group of people and take them and, you know, as slaves. And when, and when the English colonies come out, came over here, the English people came over here to colonize, there was indentured servants already. So it wasn't like we thought up the slavery thing. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, values change in religion. We, we did a thing today where we uh, took an offering in ancient times, in pre-Christian Jerusalem, even a temple, there would be a temple and the, the priest or priestess would stand there and people would bring up animals and slaughter them right in front of everybody. I mean, we don't do that. We're asking you to put some money in an envelope, a check in the envelope, but it is it's derived from that. It has evolved from that. Um, so because we set up this lofty ideal of we're all going to be equal, it's a hard bar, it's a hard standard to live up to, especially when so many people create so much wealth by subjugating others. It's hard to give that up, it's like an addiction. You see it even, um, the prison system, there's a, there is a, uh, a loophole that says that you can use people for forced labor if they're in prison. So we've actually used a lot of people as slaves. This is part of the you know, prison industrial complex, privatized prisons, people making money on this. And it's hard to give up something that you make money on. So you keep trying to rationalize it. You look around at your nice house or your you know, $85 million a year salary and you say well you know i know maybe it's maybe it's technically wrong but you know i enjoy what i have and and <clears throat> one thing is white people all benefit from this system we all have at some point in our life i remember when i was a kid now my par my parents uh, neither of them finished high school they were both working class and yet when my dad worked my dad was elevated to the level of manager and only Mexicans worked for him. There was no particular reason why he should be a manager 
except that he was white. Right? So we've all benefited in, from it in some way. Um, the question is, is can we see the ways we're benefiting from it? And can we see, can we actively look for ways to bring about better justice? You know, Lee, you've got your hand up. And then we, after Lee, we need to end. We are going over time, okay. but Lee has had <laughs> quite some time. Yes, thanks for the really good discussion and questions there. I mean, I mean, it's important to re recognize that in the transatlantic slave, slave trade since the mid 15th century up to till the 19th century uh, or late 18th century, early 19th century, uh, that, that most of the slaves weren't taken to North America. Most of them were taken to Central and South America. That's, that, that's really important to mention. It is true, as Joan said, that, that we made a very high pro profession of, uh, of the equality of people but as, um, as uh, has been point, pointed out in a very interesting book called The Counter-Revolution of 1776, one of the reasons we declared independence from Britain is because our so-called founding fathers could, could smell abolitionism in the air in the old British Empire. And we thought, oh, this is not good. You better get independent. So, um, so that's a that's that's part of it as far as the actual dictum that allowed it to go forward in in many ways you can you can go to some papal decrees under nicholas v and alexander the sixth in 1450 1455 1493 right after columbus returned which is which 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 essentially con condemned heathen non-christians to perpetual slavery and uh, and uh, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim entrepreneurs they they engaged in the slave trade in in massive ways. All three religions and all three religions could find justification for slavery within their holy books, yeah. you know. And um, so that's a way to it's a way to yeah. uh, save from the moral injury. Cor correct. So yeah. so that 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 slavery is very much connected with our religious tra traditions the last five, six hundred years, quite distinct from 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 slavery in ancient Greece or Rome, which which had other other justifications. OK, folks, time to take a break and hopefully see all of you back on Zoom. On, 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 Thank uh, you, Bonnie. on Zoom. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie.